Hello, and thank you for inviting me to speak at the 2020 Fragile Earth Workshop here at the KDD Knowledge and Data Discovery Conference. Today, I would like to present something of a big picture talk on how machine learning can be used to benefit the Earth and to solve some of the world's most challenging problems. In my job as a data scientist at NVIDIA, I give presentations about machine learning fairly often, and most of the time I spend my time describing what machine learning is and how it can benefit science particularly the earth system sciences. But in this presentation, I'd like to also focus on why it might be a good idea to devote your time and skills to these issues. However, answering the question why is necessarily a matter of judgment and opinion. And therefore, I would like to give the disclaimer in advance that any opinions expressed in this talk are my own and do not necessarily represent those of NVIDIA. Machine learning is new and powerful and it can be used to do some pretty amazing things. So with these tools in hand, I regularly ask myself, if given the opportunity to do anything I want with machine learning, what should I do? Where does it make the most sense for me to spend my time? The answer to questions like that are very different for different people. But for me, the answer is relatively straightforward. I've always been a big fan of science fiction and a person who thinks a lot about the future. And these days, I have two very small daughters who, unlike me, are young enough to see the year 2100 with their very own eyes. My goal then is to contribute to making their future the best one possible, which means helping to forge the best possible future for Earth and its inhabitants. Before getting lost in the details of how machine learning can be used to improve our future, I'd like to give a high level overview of my thought process. First, machine learning provides a new and powerful set of tools, which we can use to build amazing things. So what should we do with it? I think one of the best uses of my time is to apply my skills to ensure a positive future for the Earth and its inhabitants. Doing so is not easy, but I'm pretty sure that if we don't try, things are not going to end well. If we first clearly identify our goals, then we have some chance to build the tools and techniques needed to achieve them. At a minimum, we should try to avoid catastrophes and existential risks. And in cases where we can't avoid catastrophes, we should at least attempt to mitigate the damage. I believe all of this can be achieved with the help of AI, but we also need to carefully manage the risks imposed by AI itself. In the second half of the talk, I'll delve into some concrete examples of how these goals might be accomplished via machine learning. But for now, let's dive into these points in a bit more detail. So machine learning is new and powerful. Well, what the heck is this machine learning thing anyway? Since you're participating in the KDD conference, I expect you already have a pretty good idea what machine learning is. And in fact, you're probably pretty good at it. But everyone tends to think about these things a bit differently, and there are plenty of ways to characterize it. It's a type of AI, and it's a way of finding patterns in data. It can be viewed as a curve fitting exercise or a procedure for fitting a mathematical model to data. It's a means of building a general solution from a specific set of examples, typically in the form of regression or classification. But in my opinion, maybe the best way to think of it as, is as a way of building algorithms from experience, which in its current form allows it to act like a new way to build software. Software is composed of a set of functions that take one set of values as input and return a different set of values as output. As a given example, suppose we wish to build a function to predict how much precipitation is expected within a region, given its average temperature, pressure, and humidity. In the past, there was really only one way to do this convert expert knowledge into an algorithm, and then manually convert this algorithm into a program running on a computer. These days, there is another way to solve this problem. We can build a mathematical function that maps the inputs to the outputs and use an optimizer to find the specific function that matches our data. The idea is that once we have properly adjusted the parameters in this function, the function on the right can do just as good of a job of predicting the correct output as the function on the left written by hand. And for challenging applications, it can often do far better. Machine learning is particularly well suited to operations that deal with complex real world phenomena, which are not easily quantified. For example, while you can probably identify the atmospheric river in this image, most of us would find it challenging to program a heuristic algorithm that's able to do so automatically and reliably. In cases like this, it's simpler to label a large set of examples as containing an atmospheric river or not and allow an optimizer to automatically search for the appropriate characteristics that distinguish the two cases. While machine learning and traditional programming can both be used to develop software, they are not the same. And it's important to understand the differences. Traditional programming is labor intensive. 
It requires expert knowledge of a subject, but its algorithms are human readable and usually explainable. Machine learning produces functions by reverse engineering them from data. These functions can be complex and subtle with an implicit form dictated by the data. They can typically be developed much faster than traditional software. The learned functions can be hard to understand and they require a different mindset to debug them. Each set of tools has its strengths and weaknesses. And generally the two are most effective when used together. However, since much of machine learning has only recently become practical, rapid progress is possible by making use of these new techniques. Machine learning is currently being used in much the same way as traditional software, in that the code development and deployment stages are separate and distinct. But this is not how the human brain works. For us, learning and applying what we learn occurs in a tight, continuous, interactive loop. However, machine learning has the potential to grow beyond its current limited role. The primary reason being that both the software and the software developer are made of code. This has the potential to eventually enable continuous iterative training and improvement, which will look a lot more like learning and a lot less like engineering. Machine learning is, no, is by no means really new, and some of its ideas are as old as the computers themselves. When I say that machine learning is new, what I mean is that it's newly practical. GPUs are the tools that make machine learning practical. With a GPU, you can train a machine learning model in minutes or hours. While without it, the same model will probably take you days or even weeks. And the compute advantage provided by GPUs is growing larger every year. While the year-over-year -year performance growth of CPUs is slowed to just a trickle, the opposite is true for GPUs, with the latest generation of NVIDIA's A100s providing 20 times the peak performance of the previous version. Conversely, machine learning makes GPUs more accessible. Not only can you build next-level functionality using machine learning, but these functions are automatically optimized for GPU accelerators. In the end, you have powerful GPU accelerated software without having to port the code and without having to maintain multiple versions. With a new and powerful set of tools in hand, the question arises, what should we do with it? Not only is machine learning different from traditional programming, it allows us to build new capabilities that go well beyond what we could build before. Machine learning has been used to defeat world champions as strategy to drive cars autonomously, to communicate and translate spoken language, and to generate original images, video, music, and text, amongst many other newsworthy accomplishments. While there are many useful things you can build with machine learning, I think a worthwhile goal is to apply it to help address the major challenges facing the planet and its inhabitants. To achieve a positive outcome, we need to develop strategies that consider short-term, medium-term, and long-term goals simultaneously. Most people can relate to this idea when expressed in terms of their personal and financial goals. In the short term, you need to earn enough money for things like food, clothing, and entertainment. In the medium term, you should save for large important purchases, make decisions that develop your career, and maybe start a family. In the long term, you should stay healthy and save up enough money for college and or retirement. If you focus on any one of these to the exclusion of all the others, things will probably not work out as well as you might like. For example, if you focus exclusively on your career, you might never spend any time having any fun. Conversely, if you spend all your money on immediate needs, you might never save enough to retire. As a group, we also need to address and balance our global needs and goals. In the short term, we need to avoid accidents, avoid getting coronavirus, vote for good leaders. In the medium term, we can search for cures for known diseases, prevent wars, evacuate and repair cities when hurricanes hit, and try to improve society by reducing poverty and injustice. In the long term, we need to ensure the planet remains habitable and avoid existential threats and catastrophes and ensure that we develop and use technology safely. If we want our collective future to turn out well, we need to address all of these problems simultaneously. This means looking to the future, anticipating the world's major challenges, and then working backward to figure out how to solve them. An interesting observation is that short-term goals mostly require individual actions, while success with longer-term goals require us to act collectively or even globally. While all of these collective goals are worthwhile, many of the most interesting and impactful are closely linked with the Earth system sciences. These include preventing climate change to keep the Earth habitable and hospitable for humans, pre predicting and avoiding weather extremes, mitigating damage when they do occur, protecting the planet from space-borne threats, facilitating our progress toward renewable energy, 
ensuring everyone has enough to eat and drink, tracking the health of our biosphere, coming up with global strategies that allow us to work toward collective solutions, and ensuring that we are using AI safely. Before we work assiduously to apply machine learning to these problems, we should first address the urgency of these issues. Do these problems really require our active management or will they work out just fine if left alone? Since ensuring a positive future for humanity and the planet is a goal that, most, that would seem reasonable to most people, doesn't it stand to reason that most people will act instinctively for the common good and everything will work out all right in the end? Unfortunately, I do not think so, and there are several reasons for this. One major issue is that, as a rule, people tend to focus on their immediate problems and are often too busy to be concerned about long-term issues. Unfortunately, as discussed earlier, success requires us to solve a large set of short, medium, and long-term problems simultaneously. Another reason, as I see it, is that historically, we found our way by trial and error. And while this has served us passively well in the past, it probably won't work out too well for the future. Take climate change as a well-known example. In order to ensure that the planet remains habitable and preferably comfortable over the coming decades, all the major economic powers of the world need to make large-scale changes to their economies and the technologies they use. And the sooner they do so, the better. Will this problem take care of itself? So far, the evidence suggests no. And climate change is just one of very many significant problems we face even if we had a 50-50 chance of navigating each major problem through luck. The odds of us successfully navigating the rocky waters of the future without deliberate planning are infinitesimally small when you take into consideration all the things we need to get right. Wait a minute, you might say. The history of the world is chocked full of mistakes and we have muddled through reasonably well without some brilliant overarching global strategy. So what's different about the next 100 years? The difference lies in our technology. The future is not like the past. Our technological capabilities are increasing at an ever accelerating pace, but our ability to use that tech safely is not currently keeping up. Powerful technologies amplify our ability to influence the world, increasing our interconnectedness, thereby tying all of our fates together. In the past, if two local tribes fought and wiped each other out or even set fire to the forests I lived in, it wouldn't have much of an effect on the people living in some far-flung region or on some other continent. But now, for example, if any two countries choose to have a small nuclear exchange, it would alter the global environment for years to come, producing nuclear winter and widespread famine. No one can safely use nuclear weapons for war without endangering everyone on the planet. Another obvious example is the current coronavirus pandemic. In the absence of a cure, it's difficult for any country to keep the virus under control in the long term unless all countries manage to bring it under control. Typically, technologies aren't inherently good or bad. Most can be used both to create and destroy. Biotech, for example, can be used to cure diseases or can be used to main manufacture biological weapons. A swarm of drones can be used to search for disaster victims or they can be used as autonomous weapons to search and destroy. Heck, even fire can be used either to cook your food or to burn down your enemy's hut. Unfortunately for most technologies, there exists an inherent asymmetry that makes it far easier to destroy than to create. Which is easier, building a top tower of blocks or gleefully kicking it to the ground? Even when there is no malice or aggression involved, the use of technology tends to have unintended consequences. Take fossil fuels, for example. People figured out that you can burn them to generate electricity, make plastics, and power your cars. And these inventions have enabled us to increase our overall quality of life, particularly in the short term. But as an unintended side effect, global unchecked use of fossil fuels alters the composition of our atmosphere, harming our quality of life in the long term. Planning for a sustainable future is complex since each decision we make interacts with many other decisions and we need a strategy that carefully balances short-term gains with their long-term consequences. Historically, most of the problems we've encountered have been solved by trial and error. We collectively try things out, and then if something goes wrong, we pass a law or change our behavior to reduce the odds of it happening again. But when dealing with existential threats, trial and error is probably not the way to go, as your first error is likely to be your last. On a related note, Enrico Fermi, Fermi once famously posed the question, where is everybody? Meaning, 
why haven't we yet encountered other technologically advanced intelligent life? Considering that our galaxy has hundreds of billions of stars, most of which have planets as old or older than the Earth, why are our skies not absolutely teeming with the signs of alien life and or technology? In 1961, Frank Drake formalized this question in the form of the Drake Equation, which estimates how many civilizations exist in our galaxy at the present time. While the real numbers are unknown, most estimates seem to suggest there should be quite a few civilizations. The economist Robert Hansen in 96 suggested that there may be one or more great filters which severely limit the number of civilizations that make it to the point where we might be able to detect them. One possible candidate for such a filter is the high level of risk imposed by powerful technologies. Any civilization that has the tech to explore the galaxy also possesses the tech to destroy itself and a single bad day might be all it takes. You may have noticed that most of the risks I've described are risks of our own making. So it seems there are three fundamental approaches the world might take in how it handles technology. One, we can continue with business as usual, which is roughly equivalent to close your eyes and hope. Two, we could turn our back on technology altogether, globally eliminating its use and returning to some less technological state. Three, we can continue to develop technology ever so carefully planning out our path to avoid all the possible dead ends and pitfalls. Option one seems quite likely to lead to a sticky end, but options two and three are very hard to achieve as they seem to require global cooperation and coordination. For example, in option two, if one country gives up its tech, any country that does not can just walk all over it. Conversely, for option three, if any country handles technology irresponsibly in the future, it has the potential to wipe out all the others. It seems like the best option is probably option three, which is to continue developing technology, but to do so in as careful a manner as we can manage. This will require us to do many things right and avoid every major existential pitfall. Given the number of things we need to get right, is it even possible to find such a solution? This is a strategy problem, and this is where machine learning comes into the picture again. We can think of our choices as a high stakes game with an action space composed of all the possible individual and collective actions that people might take. If we were to build a good enough simulation of our earth and its inhabitants, we might be able to find an optimal strategy using reinforcement learning. Is such a model practical? Even if it's not, we may still be able to approximate the important parts of the solution in a piecemeal fashion, tackling each problem individually by combining AI and human expertise. So, Let's think of this as a strategy problem and see if we can plan out the next 100 years safely. The first thing you need to do when trying to solve a strategy problem is to identify your goals. What do you want to happen if things work out well? What things do you need to avoid and how important is each? In machine learning terms, we need to identify our goal state and a loss function or reward function that measures how well we're doing. So what kind of future do we want? I think most people would agree that we don't want the future that comes with unchecked global warming unless you're a big fan of the Mad Max movies. Keeping the planet habitable seems like a pretty obvious goal. Another possible scenario often seen in science fiction is a kind of world you get as a result of unchecked economic growth. In theory, you might be able to make such a world survivable with enough technology for artificially recycling food, air, and water. But this scenario generally results in the destruction of the natural world and looks to me more like a dystopia. The alternative I prefer looks something like this artist's conception, where we aim for a world where we use advanced technology to minimize our impact on the planet. With humans living here, but trying to keep the world close to a natural state as much as is practically possible. Some of the sub goals we should probably shoot for include having a stable climate, maintaining a healthy ecosystem with a diversity of living things, using technology to ensure a high standard of living for all people on the planet, advancing our technology to the point where it almost fades into the background, and using AI in a careful and cooperative fashion. Optional future goals might include exploring the reaches of space or terraforming lifeless planets, you know, just so we don't get bored. Assuming we can generally agree on the type of future we might like to have, how do we get there? Although we might not have all of the details, some major sub goals seem to be pretty clear. 
Firstly, we need to make a special effort to avoid catastrophes, particularly the ones that lead to extinction. So what are the existential risks facing us? Unfortunately, there's quite an array of showstoppers waiting just over the horizon, some of which are shown here. Step one is making sure none of these disasters come to pass, or if they do, ensuring they don't reach existential levels. In some cases, like climate change, it's clear that we are certainly in for some pain, as it's already too late to avoid its effects entirely. In cases like this, it makes sense to try and plan ahead to see if we can mitigate the impacts as much as possible. There are steps that can be taken to reduce the severity of potential threats. For pandemics, for example, we could develop cooperative global strategies for their suppression. On the subject of climate change, we can develop tools to predict extreme weather events, improve the design of our cities and supporting infrastructure, and optimize evacuation and recovery plans. Finally, we should not underestimate the challenges imposed by machine learning and artificial intelligence itself. As I've said, this tech is very powerful and has the potential to become even more so. In this picture, you can see that computer vision algorithms can automatically track thousands of faces in a crowd and even identify who is there. This means you are no longer anonymous even in a crowd of people. While AI can help us to solve problems, we also need to take a sober look at the problems it can cause. I'll come back to this at the end and review some of the issues in the last section of this talk. Now that we've identified some of our goals, we can begin building the tools which will be instrumental to achieving them. One of the most important questions we need to address is how to prevent or at least minimize climate change. There are many ways ML can help here. We can use it to improve physical models to speed them up, make them more accurate, so on. We can also build purely data-driven models that are able to make specific predictions more directly. We can also use machine learning to reduce emissions or do emergency geoengineering of the planet, but those concepts will be broken out into their own sections a bit later. The consequences of climate change can to amount to anything from a mild inconvenience to a full-blown threat to our existence, depending upon the magnitude and speed of the change. By making widespread use of fossil fuels, we're changing the composition of the atmosphere, trapping outgoing long-wave radiation, and rapidly increasing the mean temperature of the planet. The consequences of changing the climate quickly are very many, and they are all bad. So how can we prevent this giant mess from taking place? Most simply, we need to replace fossil fuels with renewable energy sources. We can switch to using electric vehicles. Then we need to build and distribute technologies that can draw CO2 back out of the atmosphere because there's already too much in there. We should avoid energy waste by recycling. We need to build and improve our climate model so we can predict the consequences of our choices. If all else fails, we might need to resort to geoengineering. Finally, these changes are all tightly coupled to our economic choices. We can prevent climate change by imposing economic penalties that appropriately account for the future costs and damages the given technology is likely to incur. As an example of model acceleration, in their 2020 paper, Menno Veerman, Robert Pincus, and their colleagues trained neural networks to emulate the RRTMGP, radiative transfer model. Radiative transfer model equations are particularly expensive and a popular first target for physics emulations. They were able to achieve a speed up of three to seven times the performance of the original model while retaining a high accuracy of less than 0.212 watts per meter squared in the outgoing long wave radiation. The plot on the left shows the speed and accuracy they were able to achieve as a function of the model size and precision. And the plot on the right shows the vertical distribution of residual errors for those same choices. All models considered were fully connected multi-layer perceptrons with dense connections. This type of model emulation can be applied to most or all physical parameterizations, leading to a large potential speed up of climate models. In the 2020 paper in Nature Communications, Yanni Yuval and Paula Gorman of MIT published a paper demonstrating how to build a more accurate parameterization of the global atmosphere. They used a random forest to learn a parameterization from coarse grained output of a three dimensional high resolution idealized atmosphere model. And this parameterization led to stable simulations at coarse resolutions that replicate the climate of the high-res simulation. The plot on the right shows snapshots of column-integrated precipitable water vapor for the high-res model, low-res model, and low-res random forest models, respectively. You can see that the default coarse model fails to capture the double ITCZ intertropical convergence zone that's produced by their high-resolution simulation. 
but that the physical parameterization generated by the random forest is able to capture it. The plot on the left shows how well each of the low-res models is able to reproduce the high-res mean precipitation and extreme precipitation values. In 2020, Prabhat, Karthik, Kashinoff, and their colleagues at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab demonstrated how machine learning can be used to improve the analysis of the data produced by climate models. In this work, they built an online tool that allows climate experts to label extreme weather events like tropical cyclones and atmospheric rivers, which were then used to train a model to automatically detect and segment those storms in future climate simulations. By doing so, they're not able to not only able to produce future storm statistics for many model runs, but they're able to precisely quantify expected changes in precipitation that will be produced for a given region as a result of these storms. By training storm segmentation models directly from expert labels, they're able to create more accurate detection routines than it would be possible to code up by hand. Chris Kadal, Uwe Oblich, and myself published a paper this year in Nature Geoscience that uses NVIDIA's deep learning-based in-painting technique to fill in missing climate data. Historically, observations can be sparse due to the limited numbers of sensors in place and the limits of seagoing ship tracks, for example. Using transfer learning, we were able to train the in-painting network on data from two sources, 20th century reanalysis data and data from the CMIP-5 climate model intercomparison project. After training, we were able to apply the model to reconstruct missing data from the HADCRUP4 climate data set, which in turn enabled us to more accurately reconstruct the global historical temperature record as far back as 1850. We were also able to reconstruct historical trends for modes of variability like the ENSO El Nino Southern Oscillation. This is an example of how machine learning can improve climate predictions, not just by improving the model, but also by repairing lost or missing historical data. We might manage to avoid the worst impacts of climate change or not, but in either case, we can expect increasing incidences of severe weather over time. And machine learning can help us both detect it and predict it. As with climate models, machine learning can be used to improve the speed and accuracy of weather models. It can be used to detect severe weather events from satellite observations like floods, fires, droughts, cyclones, atmospheric rivers, and tornadoes. It can be used to detect forest fires and predict how they will evolve. And for now casting, purely data-driven models can even exceed the speed and accuracy of physics-based models. Physics-based weather models are very valuable as they enable us to predict and avoid impending weather disasters, such as tornadoes, cyclones, and damaging hail. They're also important for forecasting future weather conditions, needed to reliably operate renewable solar and wind energy power plants. They can help us avoid crop loss by predicting heat waves or floods. And weather models can be used to evacuate cities and to reroute aircraft and boats when severe weather is inbound. Weather models are closely related to climate models and therefore machine learning can contribute to these in all the same ways discussed in the previous section. But it can also improve weather models in other ways as well. For example, they can assist in the data assimilation process. Machine learning can be used to thin out and select the most important data to assimilate. It can fill in missing or damaged observations and we can build functions that transform one type of data into another to allow for data fusion. Also, we can use machine learning to predict a full ensemble of weather prediction from just a few of its members. In their 2019 paper in AAAI, Sheila Alamani and her colleagues from Miami, Florida, demonstrated how recursive neural networks can be trained to improve the prediction of hurricane trajectories. They trained their model on data from Atlantic hurricanes in the Unisys weather database and employed an LSTM-based model taking wind speed, latitude, longitude, track direction, and distance traveled, and grid number as input. The Im image on the left shows training points used in the Unisys database, while the image on the right shows randomly selected hurricane trajectory predicting predictions, which closely match their actual trajectories. This technique is said to have comparable accuracy to the current National Hurricane Center predictions, but it's far faster to evaluate, taking seconds rather than hours. In March 2020, scientists working in Google Research demonstrated a model called MetNet that produces eight-hour precipitation forecasts that exceed physics-based weather prediction models, both in speed and accuracy. <clears throat> the output of their model covers the entire continental United States at a resolution of one kilometer, a time resolution of two minutes, and the predictions only take seconds to produce. The model inputs include radar and satellite data, and the output is a probabilistic precipitation map. 
The figure on the left shows comparisons of the model predictions with both the physically based model and ground truth observations. The plot on the right shows the F1 accuracy score of the MetNet model when compared to the physical model and the best available optical flow technique. The speed and accuracy of this model shows that purely data-driven solutions can have the potential to exceed the performance of physics-based solutions, at least in some instances, like predicting the weather over a short time frame. In July of 2020, Ryan Lagerquist and his colleagues published a paper in Monthly Weather Review in which they trained a deep convolutional neural network to predict the likelihood of tornado formation within the next hour. The model takes as input a storm-centered radar image and a proximity sounding from the RAP Rapid Refresh Numerical Weather Model. It achieves an AUC receiver operating characteristic curve value in excess of 0.9, indicating strong prediction accuracy as is shown in the figure on the left. The figure on the right shows the best and worst predictions made by the model. With models of this type, we'll be able to predict the speed with speed and accuracy of tornado predictions, enabling people to seek shelter in time to avoid them. In April 2018, researchers at the University of Waterloo published a paper describing how reinforcement learning could be applied to learn wildfire dynamic models from satellite images. This approach inverts the usual reinforcement learning setup since the dynamics of the corresponding Markov decision process is a known function. Their results indicate that reinforcement learning was able to outperform supervised learning models much of the time. Models such as this allow us to better predict how forest fire will grow and develop so that we can fight it more effectively. On a more general level, this research shows that it's possible to effectively model the dynamics of a system or agent inversely from its behavior. Another important goal for a positive future scenario is to ensure that everyone has enough to eat and drink. While this is already a challenge today, we can expect it to become far more difficult in the coming decades as the number of people increase and as climate change increasingly disrupts our weather and our growing seasons. For example, a single significant drought or flood can destroy many crops, as can heat waves or invasive plants or animals. Furthermore, it can be difficult to know where and when to plant crops when rainfall patterns keep changing. Machine learning has great potential to help us grow food more efficiently, robustly, and with a smaller environmental impact. It can help us avoid crop damage by helping to predict where and when drought floods and heat waves are likely to occur. Machine learning can help us minimize the use of pesticides, producing more successful crops at a lower cost and with less waste. It can help us track the number, distribution, and health of important pollinating species like bees. It can also help automatically detect and treat crop diseases. Finally, from a strategic point of view, machine learning can help predict food requirements and potential crop yields to ensure that the supply is adequate to meet, to de to meet the demand. Weeds are responsible for the majority of crop loss, and farmers usually control them by spraying fields uniformly with herbicides. This is expensive and dangerous for people and the environment. What's needed is a precision approach for applying herbicides precisely where they're needed. We can potentially combine drones and machine learning-based computer vision to identify weeds automatically, but weeds look so similar to the crop plants that it's very hard to build a labeled data set for supervised learning. In this 2019 paper, a group of French researchers came up with a very clever way of solving this problem in an unsupervised fashion. First, they detect the crop rows automatically, then they can find the weeds between the rows. The images of these weeds can then serve as the training set needed to train a convolutional neural network. This approach is as accurate as supervised learning, but with far less work. In order to ensure that you are producing enough food, you have to be able to predict crop yields. This can be done fairly easily in developed countries where detailed farm survey information is available, but it's challenging in developing countries. In 2017, a group from Stanford developed a novel technique for predicting crop yields directly from satellite observations. In their model, satellite images are converted to histograms of multispectral pixel counts. And then the time series of these histograms is predicted with an LSTM network. Finally, the predicted histogram is mapped to expected crop yield values using a convolutional neural network. This technique was tested on U.S. soybean fields and found to perform better than previous techniques with a mean average percentage error of only 3.3%. As residents of the planet Earth, we're just one component of a large interconnected biosphere, and it's important to maintain the overall health of that biosphere. 
Machine learning can help with this. By helping us to keep tabs on plants and animal species, tracking their locations, numbers, and health. And we can also monitor the state of the environment directly. The oceans absorb the vast majority of the carbon dioxide that's been added to the atmosphere. And without that effect, the change in the average global temperature would be much larger than we're currently experiencing. However, this uptake of CO2 is not without consequences as it alters the pH level of the ocean water. When the water becomes too acidic, it can kill off the micro microbiota that are the basis of the ocean food web, thus endangering our own food supply. Therefore, it's important to keep track of ocean acidification on a global scale. In 2019, a paper in the journal Remote Sensing of the Environment demonstrated that it's possible to use machine learning to accurately estimate the acidity level of the ocean from remotely sensed data. This group trained a random forest regression ensemble model on MODIS satellite data and exper experimentally measured observations of quantities such as surface salinity and chlorophyll concentrations. Their model is able to predict ocean acidity within a one kilometer resolution and R2 coefficient of determination of 0.95. One can only truly determine the health of the biosphere by tracking the numbers, distribution, and health of the plants and animals living within it. This is particularly important for endangered species, as species extinction is generally irreversible. Whales, in particular, are an important species that we would like to keep tabs on, but it's surprisingly hard to get a global picture of their numbers. In a 2019 paper published in Nature Research, a team from Spain demonstrated that they were able to gain an accurate whale count in a very inexpensive manner using images from Google Earth. They trained two distinct convolutional neural networks, one that identifies active whale regions and a second that identifies whales within an active region. They achieved an F1 score of 81% accuracy in detecting whales and a 94% accuracy in counting whales, giving an, a 36% improvement overall over the previous best approach. Many of the problems we face will require global strategies and global cooperation to solve. This requires us first to identify what global strategies we need and then to convince the world to adopt those strategies. Determining global strat strategies is a task that is well suited to machine learning and reinforcement learning in particular. Machine learning has demonstrated its ability to master strategic gameplay in a dramatic fashion by achieving superhuman performance in many games. But none was more dramatic than the match between Lee Sedol and DeepMind's AlphaGo in the March of 2016. Unlike chess, Go is a game with an enormous branching factor, making it impossible to beat by brute force search, even with the fastest computers available today. In this sense, Go is often considered to be a game of deep intuition. However, DeepMind demonstrated that using deep reinforcement learning and self-play, that AlphaGo was able to learn to play Go better than the world's best champions. In similar fashion, machine learning models have similarly mastered chess, shogi, poker, and other games as well. Although mastering turn-based strategy games is impressive, most real-world problems are much more complex, varied, and continuous in both space and time. DeepMind and OpenAI have demonstrated that machine learning can tackle these sorts of problems as well by training agents that can play as well as the best humans at popular esport games like StarCraft II and Dota. In the StarCraft II challenge, the machine player was intentionally hobbled so that it can't perform actions faster than a good human player to demonstrate that it's winning by superior strategy rather than just faster reflexes. They also showed an agent with the skill level could be trained in a matter of two weeks when given enough compute power, while it takes a person years to master these games. What this has demonstrated is that machine learning can be used to easily outperform most humans at strategic challenges. The implications of this to war are obvious and military leaders around the world have taken notice. This has led to an increased focus on the development of unmanned drones and autonomous weapons. This has the potential to lead to another arms race, resulting in a rise in the availability of powerful smart weapons with an ever decreasing level of human judgment and control in the loop. When considering military strategy, it's important to keep the global picture in mind. Reinforcement learning techniques can also be used to solve a whole host of critical global strategic challenges. Some examples include geoengineering to reduce climate change, 
controlling the spread of epidemics, preventing global conflicts, and accelerating scientific discovery, amongst others. At the present time, in 2020, the COVID-19 coronavirus, coronavirus pandemic is raging out of control in many countries around the world. In the 2020 journal Nature Public Health Emergency Edition, a team from India investigated various lockdown strategies for controlling the spread of COVID-19. In the absence of a cure, the only way to control the spread of a pandemic is through some form of lockdown and social isolation. However, lockdowns can result in economic damage that can lead to widespread suffering of a different kind. In their paper, they demonstrated how reinforcement learning can be used to quantitative, quantitatively optimize lockdown strategies for cities and regions that balance health and economic considerations. Employing machine learning strategies such as these at the global level has the potential to rapidly bring a pandemic under control with the minimum damage possible and to help prevent the spread of future pandemics. Another potential strategic target is geoengineering, which is a fascinating but controversial topic. Geoengineering is the process of intentionally modifying the physical properties of the earth in order to produce the climate we want. Most people consider it to be a method of last resort, to be used only if carbon emission strategies fail and global warming becomes intolerable. One of the most promising approaches is stratospheric aerosol injection, which can be used to increase the reflectivity of the atmosphere, thus cooling the planet. But as stated in the 2019 paper by Christian DeWitt and Thomas Hornigold, using this approach naively can have catastrophic regional consequences, which may induce serious geostrategic conflicts. Instead, they aim to use the power of deep reinforcement learning coupled with emulated atmosphere models in order to predict where, when, and how much aerosol to use in order to maximize the benefits while minimizing the drawbacks. In January of 2020, DeepMind published an article in Nature demonstrating that they could train neural networks to predict the folding behavior of proteins. This is an enormously challenging problem. In the CAS 13 competition, they demonstrated that their approach could predict 24 out of 43 structures while the next best te technique could predict 14 of them. If we can reliably predict how proteins fold, we can greatly accelerate the search for new drugs and treatments for diseases. Machine learning is a very powerful technology. Like all technologies, it can, it can be used for many things, both good and bad. The more we develop it, the more potential it has to help us solve our problems. But we need to tread very carefully as it has the potential to create as many problems as it solves. Information technology is, in some sense, the most powerful form of technology, as it's the one that you can use to invent all of the others. But while building new information technologies brings about huge jumps in capabilities, they can have unexpected consequences. For example, DNA and evolution invented our brains, but its goal was survival. Singing, dancing, and everything we do not direct, directly related to survival is, you know, sort of a side effect. Our brains subsequently invented speech, writing, and computers to solve our problems. But who would have guessed all the strange things people would write or the truly odd things we would end up doing with computers? Finally, machine learning is a new type of information technology that has the power to build many new systems that we can use, but we don't necessarily fully understand them. Who knows what the future technologies might be built on in this fashion and what unexpected things they might do. While the future is unknown, there are plenty of known risks and rewards that seem likely to result from machine learning and artificial intelligence. Some of these are near-term risks, while others are more long-term. In the near term, one such risk is the loss of privacy due to facial recognition. Another is that of AI bias, which comes when automating things like loan approval, job hiring, or criminal profiling. Generative models blur the lines of reality, producing deep fake videos and generated texts that are nearly indistinguishable from the real thing. And we see automation taking over an ever greater number of jobs that used to be performed by people. In the middle term, AI has the potential to lead to the proliferation of autonomous weapons and the concept of hyperwar, where humans have less direct control. If we look a bit further out, we see risks associated with artificial general intelligence. These include further risks to job replacement, ethical quandaries, and the possibility of mind crime. And once we have built an intelligence comparable to our own, one can easily imagine it surpassing us by upgrading its own hardware or software. The main risk from a super intelligent AI 
is that its goals might be different from our own, as discussed eloquently in the book Human Compatible by Stuart Russell. AGI and superintelligence are highly controversial topics, and experts in the field of AI have a wide range of opinions on when or even if this is possible. But if we are looking to build a strategic plan for the next 100 years, I think they're topics that should be taken seriously and investigated carefully as well. In summary, forging a future we might want to live in will require us to choose our actions carefully, both individually and as a group. A winning strategy will require us to address many challenges, technical, social, and economic, simultaneously. Machine learning is one of the most powerful tools at our disposal, and it can help us to achieve these goals. Many of the most exciting opportunities can be found in the overlap between machine learning and the earth system sciences. The examples I selected represent a good start, but we have a long way to go. I look forward to seeing what amazing tools and solutions we can build with the help of machine learning together. Thank you for your attention and please feel free to contact me at dhall at nvidia.com.